This is Sound Ideas on GLT. I'm Mike McCurdy. Discrimination comes in many forms. African Americans continue to battle the long-held beliefs they are an inferior race. For others, the problem is just the opposite. It's a false claim that all Asians are highly successful and are achieving at great ends. Ahead during Sound Ideas, you'll hear from Nicholas Hartlep. He doesn't have an Asian-sounding name, but the native Korean is an expert on the model minority stereotype. Also, John Norton introduces you to the son of a Southern rock legend, Devin Allman, son of Dwayne, has a new group and album, Royal Southern Brotherhood. And you'll find out if babies dream. All of that and more August 16th, 2013 on Sound Ideas. A news update from the GLT newsroom ahead after this news from NPR. This is Sound Ideas on GLT. I'm Mike McCurdy. If you haven't said it yourself, you've heard others say it. Asians are really smart. They don't need help getting into college. They don't need help getting jobs. Well, today's guest would fiercely argue that point. He's out with a book on what's known as the model minority stereotype. WGLT's Willis Kern has more. Our guest today is Nicholas Hartlip. He is an assistant professor of educational foundations at Illinois State University. And his uh, latest book is called Model Minority Stereotype, Demystifying Asian American Success. Nicholas, welcome to Sound Ideas. Thanks for having me. There was a Pew Research study released this past spring that concluded Asian Americans are better educated than other ethnic groups. They're richer, they believe in hard work, and they're happy to be here. What's wrong with those conclusions? Well, the, those are very stereotypical um, statements, and that I'm, I'm familiar, Willis, with that report, and that report has generated a lot of, a lot of uh, discussion and conversation. And that report done by the Pew had problems with how it aggregates all Asians together, and, and that's part of the model minority stereotype, this, you know, homogenizing all Asians into this group that are highly successful. And so much work has been done that shows um, very strong, strongly that it depends on what subgroups you are in your history. And so it's, it's a false claim that all Asians are highly successful and are achieving um, at great, great ends, like the report suggests. Well, you're of Asian descent, and you were adopted into a, a white family and lived in Wisconsin, and you have a very Anglo-sounding name. What kind of discrimination did you experience when you were growing up? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, um, a, a, a funny story, I was going to do research with a, a, another Korean-American um, professor, and I... Uh, we, we, we emailed each other and uh, we said, you know, we'll meet in such and such location. And, uh, and she was looking for someone that was white because of my name, Nicholas. She didn't know that I was Korean as well. And so some of the, the experiences that I've faced um, in, in schools and society have been called, you know, stereotypes, uh, you know, um, being called gook or chink or um, made fun of my eyes. Um, uh, so anything that they could do to show difference that I was not white or I wasn't American. But but as you know, like you just indicated, I'm a naturalized citizen. I was born in Seoul, South Korea, but, but I have a U.S. passport. I have a driver's license. And culturally speaking, I'm very much white. Um, but racially speaking or phenotypically I look more Korean or Asian so so yeah it has been an experience that I've had to deal with now some people are probably wondering what do we mean when we talk about the model minority stereotype or MMS as as uh, we might refer to it here during the interview this was put forth about 50 years ago when William Peterson wrote about it in the New York uh, Times an article called success Japanese American style and what did he write about well, so he was writing about Japanese um, immigrants um, saying that Japanese in America were achieving at high levels. And he juxtaposed their supposed high achievement and success with um, the lack of success of, of a black community. 
And so the, the report, one must have a context for why Peterson's report or um, New York Times Magazine article, um, it's kind of a setup. And what do I mean by that? Well, um, it came in the wake of of another report that essentially talked about the the problems with the Negro family um, structure, and it, during that time, it was uh, a report that was released, and it basically blamed African Americans for having this culture of poverty. And so, the timing of Peterson's re- uh, article was perfect because right after that, you know, um, report that was. Um, blaming the victim, this report is saying, hey, look, Asians are achieving at great lengths. Look at the Japanese. Why are the blacks complaining? Why do they need welfare? Why do they need these social services when Japanese are doing it and they're problem free? And so it was very much political. It was very much premeditated in terms of when to publish that report. And so Peterson's report put into motion the model minority stereotype and I guess you could define the model minority stereotype as <clears throat> you know this idea that Asians are successful they don't have problems they don't have mental health issues they don't need um, social services and so so you're absolutely right William Peterson at least in the context of the United States introduced the MMS all right so we'll get back to uh, some of the the problems that that are currently still existing because of uh, some of those stereotypes that he highlighted there and and, and, are, and you continue to highlight in, in your book. You're tuned to Sound Ideas here on GLT. I'm Willis Kern, and we're visiting with Assistant Professor of Educational Foundations at Illinois State University, Nicholas Hartlip, who has uh, written the book Model Minority Stereotype, Demystifying Asian American Success. Let's talk a little bit about the history leading up to the uh, 60s designation of MMS. Uh, Nisai, or children of Japanese immigrants in the U.S., were used as pawns by the U.S. government and military, which placed them into segregated units to maximize their visibility and showcase their loyalty to America and its version of democracy at a critical time. Here's a clip of President Harry Truman addressing some of these Japanese-American soldiers during a, a White House medal ceremony, and this was from 1946. You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice, and you won. Keep up that fight, and we'll continue to win. You've beaten the enemy, and you've beaten prejudice. Uh, Was that an accurate assessment of conditions at that time? Well, I'm glad you used the word pawn, because I've used it in my own scholarly writing, and others have as well. Um, I'm not familiar with that clip, but I'm glad you played it for our listeners. But um, I would suspect, right, is how the model minority stereotype I previously mentioned it's a rhetorical and political construct. Construct. Um, it, it's it's fascinating to me that Truman could be talking about um, you know Asian Asians, um, presumably Chinese or Japanese, in such a context, right? Because very much Japanese in America were vilified, so the internment, um, which you know, not, no, there was no um, finding of um, espionage of the Japanese that were interned. And um, so it's interesting how it the yeah so the model minority stereotype um, as I've already said it's this stereotype of high achievement but also it it's part and parcel to another stereotype of yellow peril and so yellow peril is this idea that Asians are taking over we have to be worried about them for various reasons um, whether it be labor issues or women that have to be you know protected from <clears throat> men. And so there's a lot of internal contradictions to the model minority stereotype, right? And so that that statement by our president, to me, it just rings hollow because, um, you know, and and, and also there, uh, I'm not familiar, I don't recall the the exact title, but some of the um, most decorated um, groups of military troops have been um, Asian Americans. So it's really interesting to me. Amy Chua uh, gained fame a while back as what's known as a tiger mom, driving her kids to success through high discipline and extreme effort. Many, I think, assume that this is a philosophy rooted in some deep Asian culture. Or is it just one example of one person's hyperparental behavior? Yeah, so Chua has received um, a lot of attention and continues to. Um, Yeah, I've read the book. I'm sure some of our listeners have read the book. 
the problem I had with uh, Tiger, uh, the Tiger Mom book, um, Battle Him, was that, you know, it doesn't take into consideration that Amy Chua herself is highly educated. Yale professor, I believe her husband's a Yale professor, fairly wealthy if you read the book. Anyone that can afford to fly her kid, to take violin lessons, et cetera, et cetera, let alone even have a piano in their home. So I, the suggestion that culture, right, so that's a facet of the modern minority stereotype is that how do we explain Asian success? Well, it is their culture. And so the modern minority stereotype is by, by many um, on the outside, it's, it's not viewed as being racist. It's, you know, it's culture that leads Asians to be good mathematicians, and it's culture that leads Amy Chua to parent in ways that she does. And but, but that in and of itself is racist because there isn't really a culture, an Asian culture per se, because we're talking about so many different ethnic um, groups and different histories. And so um, there's plenty of, of white Anglo European descent families that parent in a very authoritarian way that Amy Chua suggested in her book. And many psychologists now are writing about this and studies and journals and peer reviewed journals are writing about this. So, so I, I, I find the book highly problematic and it, it just reinforced the stereotype. And furthermore, the last thing I want to say is her child, Sophie, or one of the, her daughters actually got into, I think, Yale and Harvard. I think she ultimately selected Harvard. So the general public, they see this book, they see the success story of that book, and then it just reinforces their understanding of a stereotype to be true. Nicholas Hartlep, author of the book Model Minority Stereotype, Demystifying Asian American Success. Coming up, Hartlep talks with GLT's Willis Kern about how a recent U.S. Supreme Court ruling affects minority college enrollment and Asian American students. This is Sound Ideas on GLT. comes from Specs Around Town, bringing you the world of eyewear from France, Germany, England, Belgium, Italy, Austria, Denmark, and Drift Eyewear, designed, engineered, and manufactured completely in the USA. Details at specsaroundtown.com or 317 North Center in downtown Bloomington. This is GLT. It's Sound Ideas. Ahead, we'll check in with Republicans at the State Fair. You'll find out if babies dream, and you'll hear music and conversation with Devin Allman. The new self-titled release from his band is called Royal Southern Brotherhood. I'm Mike McCurdy. Willis Kern is speaking with ISU Assistant Professor of Educational Foundations, Nicholas Hartlep. In his new book, Hartlep contends many people still hold positive, yet long and valid stereotypes of Asian Americans. In the introduction of your book, you cite some sports-related occurrences involving the media that underscore the perpetuation of discrimination against Asian Americans. And then last month, there was the telecast of the fake names of the pilots in the uh, Asiana Airlines crash in San Francisco. An observer may view this as a dichotomy of favorable versus unfavorable discrimination. You would argue that really it's all just plain discrimination altogether. Yeah, absolutely. So a facet of the modern minor stereotype is that Asians are successful, right? They're the best minority, but yet they're not white. They're honorary whites, as some have, have called them. So I'm very familiar with um, the, the, the names that came out after the Asiana flight. A few things that listeners should li- uh, think about in terms of those. One is um, it's this idea of who belongs and who isn't. Like who is American, who isn't, just as well as what caused the internment of Japanese Americans. But... Um, Part of it is is just uh, insensitivity. I mean, here I, I'm new to we. My family is new to Illinois, but Pekin, Pekin, I believe it's called Pekin, mm-hmm. Illinois. Up until the 1980s, the Pekin, um, they their school mascot was called the Chinks. Correct. And so the ESPN, um, they they've gotten in trouble with Jeremy Lin when they ran an uh, editorial that said chinking the armor. And uh, before that, there were uh, there's many many examples within athletics and outside of athletics where just this insensitivity. Michelle uh, Kwan loses to an American. Absolutely, right. absolutely. And so um, 
It's 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 this is partially why I believe writing books like these and, and talking about these issues are important. When it gets to discrimination against Asian Americans, as we have already discussed, Asians in particular tend to get grouped in as one big whole. And if you if you analyze those names that were broadcast, those phony names that were were actually broadcast as real, they sounded more Chinese than they did Korean. So already you have a stereotypical portrayal built into an unfortunate incident. <clears throat> Absolutely. And post 9-11, we're having issues, right, of who constitutes as Asian. In the, in the public imagination due to media and movies, um, images cause us to believe Asian is more Eastern Asian. So you have Eastern Asian features and names and, and, and appearances. However, um, you know, South Asian um, people of color have had issues, um, especially post 9-11 because of terrorists, of, of lumping them into being, you know, Muslim terrorists and darker skinned. And so the Asian, who constitutes Asian and Asian in America is, is, is a difficult task because there's so many subgroups and it's so diverse. And we're talking about immigrants coming to the United States. Um, and unfortunately, um, we, we are immediately drawn to, like you said, more of these clues that cause us to believe it's more Chinese or Japanese, East Asian. Where do Indians and Pakistanis and people of that part of the world fit into the whole model minority stereotype? Are they today's 1960s version of Asian Americans? Things are being attributed to race and ethnicity and culture when one has to look at socioeconomic status. And so you, you do have a high majority of South Asian Indians, uh, other, other um, groups of Asian Asians that are doing well in the United States. <clears throat> and you, it's, not, it's not uncommon to hear stories of Indian, Indian students who um, were not able to get into their elite colleges and universities in India and then come to the United States to do their education. In fact, there are some institutions in India that are more difficult to get into than Harvard in, in America. And so if one has the financial resources to kind of shop around to get into the, the best university, um, I think that's highly problematic. And when we look at immigration patterns, I think that's really telling um, in terms of who are we talking about? What type of immigrant are we talking about? Are we talking about refugees who had to leave due to political persecution or financial reasons? Or are we talking about people who have the financial means to, to come and better their lives? And so South Asians, um, they really complicate the model minority stereotype and add to the richness of this discourse. Last thing I would like to say is that um, Vijay Prashad wrote a book, um, Karma of Brown Folks, and he talked about, he juxtaposed the question to W.E. Du Bois, and he said this, he said, how does it feel to be a, um, the answer? And Du Bois asked, how does it feel to be the problem? And those two questions or um, thoughts um, are related because blacks have perennially been viewed as the problem, right? Um, problematic or, or whatnot. And Asians as model minorities are the solution. And so they're used as exactly what you said before, pawns in this black-white binary. And so in, the, in America, we tend to view things in black and white and racial, our racial paradigm is black and white. So Asians as yellow and brown people disrupt our notion and understanding of, of power and, and achievement in the United States. You're tuned to Sound Ideas here on GLT. I'm Willis Kern, and we're visiting with Assistant Professor of Educational Foundations at Illinois State University, Nicholas Hartlip, who has uh, written the book Model Minority Stereotype, Demystifying Asian American Success, Suicide. This is a problem in the Asian community, as it is across society, but particularly, particularly in the Asian community. I think I read that 13 of 21 suicides over a period of time are Asians. And the uh, individual who committed the worst school shooting in the history of uh, colleges in the United States was uh, Asian American. So we're talking about some deep-rooted problems. How come we don't hear more about these problems when it relates to Asian Americans? We need more counter-narratives. The narrative is that model, uh, Asians are model minorities. A counter-narrative is simply a narrative that refutes such a, uh, such a narrative. And so 
you're absolutely right. Um, he was a Korean American, the Virginia Tech shootings. Um, my colleague Eliza No at uh, UC Fullerton does um, a tremendous amount of research in suicide of Asian Americans um, and is an expert in this area. Um, I think that, Willis, I think the, why we don't um, report on this is because it we, we don't tend to report on things that we don't believe is there are there. So we tend to report on problems we feel are, exist. And so Asians and their mental health status isn't a problem that's on our radar screen. Um, yes, um, public health um, officials are starting to see this, but general, the AP and newspapers, they don't, they don't know about this. Earlier this summer, the U.S. Supreme Court remanded the case Fisher versus the University of Texas back to a lower court. The case deals with a Texas law allowing universities to grant automatic admission to the top 10 percent of a given high school class. This was seen as a colorblind way to promote high achievement. What are the flaws in that approach? Each state has different ways in which it, 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 it goes about, um, supposedly about get, getting diversity. So some have percentage plans, some do have affirmative action. I think the Fisher case is telling, and Asians in particular are, re, are related or linked into discussions on affirmative action. Why? Well, if Asians are highly successful and they're overrepresented, you know, if they're taking over prestigious universities, well, then they're deemed as, you know, they shouldn't be beneficiaries of it. And so affirmative action for Asians, some groups are suggesting that Asians um, need to, they fare better in colorblind s scenarios. And um, a term for this is called negative action. So negative action um, is a scholarly term developed, and it, it simply means that um, Asians are hurt by affirmative action. And and so uh, amicus briefs have been written about this. Um, and w one problem that I see with affirmative action, if it's abolished and we're purely colorblind, is Asians and other um, groups of um, students of color will be hurt in the long run. Um, a lot of research supports that the beneficiaries of affirmative action have been middle class white women. And so it's interesting, right, Abigail Fisher uh, is a white a woman. She's suing and um, doing all of this in court. And uh, so affirmative action, a lot has been written and it's continually being written about the linkage with the model minority stereotype and Asian Americans. How do you see this playing out? It, I'm not a Supreme Court expert, but I, I do see societally um, in some ways we're opening up. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't be shocking to me if we more, move more towards a, a class analysis um, as opposed to a recent um, analysis, meaning that it will be more economic-based affirmative action as opposed to race-based affirmative action. How do you break down the stereotype as someone looks at a young Asian-American boy or girl who's about to enter college and says, they don't need any help, they're smart, they're rich, they have what it takes, they'll succeed? That is problematic, and that's why um, I've, I've um, edited a forthcoming book, The Model Minority Stereotype Reader, Critical and Challenging Readings for the 21st Century. And in that book, it's more for teacher educators and in-service teachers to, to say, look, not all Asians, like you said, are successful, and some do need support and resources. Um, one area that um, needs to be um, addressed in terms is, is in terms of policy. And I know um, Robert Taranishi, um, he's recently moved to UCLA, has done great work with the CARE group on um, basically debunking all of these myths, you know, and suggesting that Asians aren't concentrated in four-year prestigious universities. In fact, there's, they're concentrated in two-year community colleges. And so we need to break these false perceptions of Asian Americans and their needs and better understand what they do in fact need. Nicholas Hartlip, Assistant Professor of Educational Foundations at Illinois State University. We appreciate your time today. Thank you for stopping by Sound Ideas. Thank you. Hartlip's new book is called Model Minority Stereotype, Demystifying Asian American Success, and it's out now from Information Age Publishing.